Hello, everyone. So today we have a guest. Uh, it's Colby Fayok. Colby, can you introduce yourself? Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Colby Fayok. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Apple Tools, and I'm also a developer and designer. I do a lot of educational content creation. Um, I have my own YouTube channel, and that's kind of where Maxime found me. And you know, we uh, the link will be in the description. Subscribe to Colby. Oh, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some of that today. Yeah, and uh, first of all, I would like to mention that Colby has great personal websites. He has two. Could you please show us uh, both of them? There is jellyfish.com, space jellyfish, right? Yep, yep. Adding your screen to the okay. stream. And there is another one. So, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, so we were actually just talking about this, uh, you and I, before. So I, I actually have two websites. I have my space jelly. Uh, dot dev, which is kind of I, the way I see it is it's my tutorials website. So as you can see going down, it's how to, how to, how to. Um, but then I also have my personal website, colbyfayok.com, which is this is where I really see uh, like more personal content. So I'll do more thought pieces or like, um, you know, roundups of my content creation where it's less like a step by step tutorial. Um, so it it makes more sense in my head than it probably looks. But, you know, that's uh, I try to I try to do what I can. That's uh, I really like this uh, jellyfish animal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, first question that I would like to ask is um, what are the benefits of having your own personal website, your blog? And you have even two personal websites like why would you recommend to to have a personal website? So let's start off with just having a personal website generally. I think it's it's really powerful for really anybody because you're really building your you're starting your own kind of personal brand. And I know sometimes people can feel a little weird about saying it's a personal brand, but really you're kind of establishing what people's initial thoughts and perceptions of you are. So when somebody Googles your name, you know, they might see a Twitter profile, but they'll also see the link to your website where they can go and kind of see what you're about, where you give your chance to kind of present yourself. Um, so here, you know, I still just have a bunch of my social links, but people can get an idea of like who I am. And like I said, my thought pieces, um, that's really where people get to know like what kind of content I produce and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so the reason why I did a separate website from Space Jelly is I like I really wanted to make it separate so that um, I didn't want ColbyFayok.com to really just be a bunch of tutorials that I pushed people to. So I just kind of thought about it in terms of like I'm kind of building this Space Jelly brand kind of thing where I'm just using the character around for my social media stuff um, so that I just created SpaceJelly.dev. And this is I figured this is where I can push people to for tutorial content. And then if they want to learn more about um, some of like the thought provoking stuff, that's where I'll push them over to um, my personal website. Mm, nice. Now it makes sense. I, I I got it. So one is a personal website, another one is basically a business, where you educate. yeah, and business is a loose term because you know I don't I don't see myself making millions of dollars off this site. Like there's I don't have any kind of advertising or anything on it yet. It's just really my uh, personal newsletter sign up form. Um, but you know it's where like I kind of have all my public facing uh, educational. Um, platforms like this is where I also host my uh, Kobayashi Maru calendar, which uh, you're going to be joining, uh, I think, in like a couple weeks. Um, so I'm excited about that. But um, people can come on here and see that kind of stuff. I also use it as like my source where I show like some of the work. I, it's still a work in progress, but um, some of like the books and courses that I've made. Um, but really, it's like the education portal where um, the other stuff would be like more my opinions on things. I really like how it's uh, all organized. I definitely need to also uh, give some love to my website. Uh, if you, I just show it for comparison, so you see what I mean. Uh, share screen, uh, tab, here we go. All right, do you see my screen? I do, yep. Yeah, so this is how it looks like now. So first of all, I have no idea how did I get, <laughs> why did I think that there's not blurry, but stripy background is um it's not very easy on ice i would say it helps you focus on the content though so that's a good thing yeah and then there is just um a list of my articles on different topics and i'm using here uh just a basic gatsby setup with some 
constant theme. Okay. So, so it is a statically generated website. So every time I need to publish a new article, I need to open it locally on my machine or in Git, um, edit the markdown file, and then uh, push it to master branch, our main, and wait until it's built, and then the whole site is redeployed with a new updated article. Can you can we talk a little bit about your setup, like how uh, your website does work? How do you update your materials? How do you add articles? Sure. So my ColbyFayok.com website is actually very similar to what it sounds like you have. Um, it's Gatsby based and it pulls in markdown files. I think really the the biggest difference for me there is that I use Netlify CMS, which when you have it connected to your site, all it really does is use GitHub to interface with uh, the markdown files. So it just provides a nice rich experience on top of the markdown files and it's all git based so it's it's really just editing those markdown files and just giving a better writing experience right um, unless mm -hmm. you prefer markdown but ultimately once you make the change it commits and you know it kicks off that gatsby build process and deploys it out to netlify um, now as for my space daily.dev website i wanted something a little bit more um a little bit easier to kind of manage a bunch of moving pieces. So like I was saying, I have my uh, my books that I want to show. I have my Colby Maru that I want to show. And I really see that as a bunch of different like content pieces where um, like I have my blog post, I have my Colby Maru episodes, I have my books and those. So I've set those up into different post types and I use WordPress for my space jelly.dev. So as you can, if you're familiar with the WordPress ecosystem, um, you can create those coast, custom post types. So each of those are a custom post type, and I can pull them in separately into different pieces throughout the application. Um, I use Next.js to kind of pull those in and bundle it all together, which will show you something similar uh, in a little bit here. But ultimately, I am the type of person that doesn't want to maintain my CMS or like I just I would rather maintain my website code and not have to think too much about my actual CMS. So that's why I like WordPress because I can get the best part of it, which it has a great editing experience and it has great plugins to manage those different content types. But then I can pull it into my code where I use GraphQL via WP GraphQL, um, where I just query my, co my content and I dump it mm -hmm. into the pages where I want. What you say is very interesting because when I think about WordPress, uh, I didn't know that it has an API, and you don't necessarily need to use it both as a uh, like front-end looking page and your uh, admin panel, like the exactly. CMS. That's, uh, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, so like traditionally, like uh, most people think of WordPress as it's going to be everything out of the box, right? Um, but because of the whole, like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the terminology of Jamstack, but Jamstack is like, you have your static site and it reaches out to APIs or at build time, kind of like Gatsby, exactly like Gatsby. Um, but what you would do is you would query to what it's called a headless WordPress instance, um, where it's you're the same WordPress that you know and love, but you're reaching out to the API in order to fetch that content and data. Where by default it comes with a REST API, uh, but and, and it works completely fine. But you know, similar to other. Uh, instances of where GraphQL kind of really shines is you can query across different data sets. So no mm -hmm. longer do you have to chain a bunch of REST requests together, which can be cumbersome if you want to attack a bunch of large data sets where you can use GraphQL to really do some powerful things with querying your content throughout the application. That sounds really cool. So it's more like an API frontend rather than CMS. So CMS is kind of a nice add-on to it. But what it really yeah. is an, is a nice layer between your front-end applications and your data. That exactly. sounds really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice. And, and about, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I enjoy it. And it, it works out really well for my use case. And um, the nice thing is, like, I don't have to go through a bunch of code anytime I want to make a big structural change. I can mm. create a new post on the fly right inside WordPress and then add it into a GraphQL query. Mm. This is actually like uh, with this code uh, post, like posting code workflow with Git. You mean you know what I mean? I actually got discouraged from making new posts, and this is why I, I stopped blogging. I'm kind of trying to start it again from Twitter, and now I'm I'm thinking to either um, migrate my blog to some platform like Hashnode or like Dev Two or something like this. But now that I've heard that you can have a uh, WordPress on the backend. 
and anything that you want. For example, my guest beside or Next.js on the front end. That's really that's really cool. Absolutely, and like it, I think that's one of the beautiful parts about it because since it's headless, like you really have the flexibility to do whatever you want on the front end, mm -hmm. and like it's just a queryable data API at that point with the which a rich editing experience. Um, so yeah, it's I like it a lot. Now I'm really like uh, I would really like to dig into the technical <laughs> details and see how it's done because, for example, how good is support? Like, how much boilerplate do you have to write to access this uh, WordPress instance? Or on the WordPress uh, side, how much do you have to do to make it all happen? So it's actually really straightforward, and I'll show you in a bit. Uh, the one comment I wanted to make before we dive into that kind of stuff is, mm -hmm. um, so just because you mentioned hash node and like Dev2 and stuff, I think you know it's very important. Like I find it very important to still be able to own your content. So that's why I have spacejelly.dev and I post and host my own content. But I think using platforms like Hashnode and Dev2 are still powerful because you can add those links canonically where any SEO juice will pass back, but you'll still be able to gain the benefit of being in that hmm. Hashnode uh, network and community where people can see that that might not normally visit your website because you know there's there's so much content in the world like and everybody's trying to get their content seen. So being able to have a platform like Hashnode just helps make that a little bit easier. So you basically recommend to cross post, to have your own website as your base. And then if you want to promote it inside different communities, you just cross post to whatever, like Medium, Dev2, whatever. Exactly. And when you cross post, the nice thing is adding those canonical links. So with Medium, you would, I believe it's you import the post. I haven't posted to Medium lately, but you would import it. And that way they add that canonical link to your mm. page. So it passes the credit back to your own hosted website. Um, but similar to Hashnode, they have a little setting in the, when you go into, uh, when you're creating your post, you mm -hmm. basically paste in the content and in the side and the settings, they'll have a little field where you can post the canonical link, which would be the website path for your particular blog post. Mm. Uh, I actually have another question just before we begin uh, digging into the code. On your yeah. uh, personal website, I think you do this, you pull in the Twitter threads. Do you do it manually or you somehow automate it? Are you talking about the Learn Next.js? Yeah, for example, this one, because if you scroll down, it's actually split up in a bunch of tweets. I thought maybe you actually <laughs> being the Twitter API or something like, how do you do this? No, I wish. Uh, and that's probably a great idea. I do this very manually, did this one very mm -hmm. manually. This was actually my first time doing a Twitter thread. So um, I was trying to just comp or, you know, fight against the idea that Twitter threads can come and go really quickly. Right. So I wanted mm -hmm. a way to kind of document on this, all this content. So I put it up on my website and that way people can still see it. And I also saw that there were a lot of services, which is really cool that can kind of go out there and do that. But it's, you know, there's some interesting things that people are doing, but I wish, you know, automating it is definitely something that would be cool. Yeah, that would be really awesome. Okay, so are we ready to jump into the technical details of, of how, to, how to use WordPress with Next.js? I think so. So where do you want to start? <laughs> um, there, there are two options. We can review what you already have or start from scratch. So let's start with your setup, maybe. What do you think? OK. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, since I'm the one driving, I realize that I can just probably hop into my AWS account and spin up a new WordPress instance. That way, we can kind of show that, really, it is. Well, I can show the WordPress instance I already have, because uh, I already have okay. the, the one for Next.js WordPress starter. Um, so while I log in there, so I created this Next WordPress starter. Um, and this is kind of what I'm going to focus on for uh, what I'm going to show everybody today. But what it really does is it takes any WordPress site that already exists. And as long as you install the WP GraphQL um, plugin into your website, you can pull all the content in and just have a really simple blog kind of bootstrapped immediately. And it's static and like it has every pretty much everything you would expect out of a typical WordPress site, but it's kind of out of the box and it pulls it right into Next.js. Like it even has page support and this is all dynamic. And I think one of the cooler things is it also has search support. So while, you know, some of these search queries might not make sense, but if I search those words, you can see that it pulls it down and I'm doing mm -hmm. that by pre-generating a search and index so that all this search is happening client side and we can kind of get into that later um, but this is kind of where we're going to start from and let me pull up the github for that next wordpress starter yeah it would be cool if you would send me a link for example i, I would also add it to the description of this yeah, video sure because i think it's quite cool 
Thank you. I just sent it in the right. chat. Yeah, cool. got it. I'm going to edit now. Cool. Um, so let's go over and let's look at, this is what my WordPress instance looks like that's actually hosting this next WordPress um, site. And really, this is a pretty much out of the box installation from AWS LightSail. Um, the only real difference is I have Jetpack on here, which actually comes by default. And really, I'm only using it to kind of uh, put the C the images behind a CDN. Um, it's just a way for the images to not have to query the server each time. Um, but as you can see, I also have WP GraphQL, I have WP Graphical, and I have WP Mail, which is just a way for me to be able to send mail with it mm -hmm. because out of, the, out of the box it doesn't have that so what i'm getting at is this is a pretty much out of the box uh, installation along with some fake content just to kind of see what it works like um so the cool thing is that i want to show is if we actually go into the graphql ide which is powered by graphical we can actually start to see what this content looks like so i'll just start this kind of back from scratch so we can see but if you've never seen Graphical before, what it pretty much does is it gives you this nice interface that you can kind of set up some example uh, GraphQL queries, and that way you can use that directly in your code. So for mm -hmm. instance, right here, we can come over and find the posts node, which we can select that, select the edges, the node, and here we're going to have access to all of the actual posts. So let's grab the ID, we can grab the, the title, um, mm -hmm. we can even grab so the slug. Go ahead. So all the data is exposed through this uh, left window, all the entity that, entities that you can have. And then exactly. on the right one, you basically construct the query. What do you want to exactly. get? What kind of fields from what entities? And you can write this by manual, uh, by hand too, if you want. I just, I'm not as like, uh, I'm not quite the GraphQL expert. So that's why I like using the visual editor for that. Um, but it's all queryable just like it would be for any other GraphQL uh, interface. But, you know, once I, uh, click play, it actually makes that query. And we can see that I now have all of that, all of those posts that I would have expected. And it's all coming straight from the WordPress uh, backend. So it's, you know, it's a great way to be able to query that data easily. And the same goes for everything else, like whether it's the pages or really anything, we can come in here, build our queries and use them right inside of our application. So Cool. So we have our default WordPress instance, and we have the ability to actually uh, query GraphQL on there. So let's kind of spin up a new uh, WordPress website. Mm -hmm. So with this, the starter, being that it's Next.js, we can use it as a quote starter and pass in this repo as the example, which it'll create that website from scratch. So I'm going to copy and paste this into my terminal and go to my code. Let's yarn create next app, the example, and what should we call this? What should we call our website? Demo demo website. Or let's let's ask our viewers, like folks, What's a, what do you think should be the name? Yeah. Anything fun? We'll have to wait a little bit, like 20 yeah. seconds or something. <laughs> but I really like what, what you already show is is really nice. Yeah, the uh, I think it's really powerful that you can have the GraphQL interface because like you do have the REST API and I can't remember what exactly like the URL is was I show it, but it's mm -hmm. a typical REST API. And while it works, it's just a little bit more cumbersome to query large amounts of data uh, that are related between the different data. And you don't stores. have this introspection where you can basically use the interactive tool to construct your query. Exactly. Super nice. Exactly. Just nice well, development uh, experience. We gotta, we got a few things yeah. in here. Colby Stack, WordPress, what do you like? random projects. Colby Stack sounds cool. Colby Stack, okay. It's Colby yeah. Stack. As we can see, if you're not familiar with Next.js, what this is going to do is it's going to pull down the GitHub repository. Uh, we can see here it's downloading the files. It's going to create that uh, that project folder for us. And it's also going to install all the dependencies for us, which is just a nice and easy way to get bootstrapped with a new project. So let's CD into that directory. I'm going to also open that in my code editor. Oh, by the way, Colby, what is your terminal th theme? What are you using? Oh, my terminal theme? Uh, I think I custom did this. Whoa. <laughs> um, That's cool. 
and I don't think I think I just kind of went in here and played around. Um, I don't know if there's a way. It's been like this for so long. I I really. So have you no randomly idea. <laughs> made it look nice, really? <laughs> yeah, I might have. Oh, thank you. I might have started from like yeah, maybe I started from this like space gray '80s and kind of tweaked it to my liking. Um, That's. I cool. think that kind of looks right. Yeah, but yeah. Um, cool. Uh, but the uh, the actual code editor is Night Owl, which actually looks somewhat similar. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. So we're in our projects, and we can see we're starting off with the Next.js site. Um, in sort inside of the source uh, directory is where most of our actual content and code files live. So as you would typically expect, we have our Pages folder where we have like our home page, and this is where we go through. We build all of our components, and we actually grab the data where we map through the different posts. And we can see how that works by uh, going to the bottom. We're using get static props and get paginated posts. This is just a helper function that we created. But let's search for that function. And this, this function is executed when you build the pages the st exactly. statically. Exactly. Mm. So personally, I just like to try to go static first. And I've also tried to kind of take going WordPress into a static site as a bit of a challenge because I thought it would be fun for such a dynamic site. So I'm doing everything that I can to make every part of this WordPress WordPress site completely static. Wait, um, wait a second. What, I don't understand how does it work. So when you publish a new blog, is there some cron job or something? How does it understand that you need to rebuild the site statically? Oh, sure. OK, or like... yeah, I guess I didn't, I didn't cover that part. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like for Space Jelly because currently mm -hmm. I don't have that set up for my other one. Um, notice I'm still using IPs for my project. Uh, so there's actually a plugin called WP Webhooks, and I can show you what that looks like. And so what this is going to do is anytime, I don't know if you should actually be able to see that URL, but um, I'll have to update that after just in case. Anyways, uh, what that's going to do is it's going to trigger a new Netlify build on these different events. So as we can see here, send data on new post, post update, and post deletion. So anytime, like WordPress is a series of hooks inside itself. So anytime WordPress itself triggers one of these webhooks, it's going to post a request to this webhook, webhook URL, which is set up in Netlify. So that it just simply triggers a new build. And inside that new build, it will refresh the content pulling from the API. So that's where it keeps up in sync um, and makes sure that the content always gets updated. So in this instance, it's going to come through and it's going to rerun these functions that pull that data. This is so cool. Yeah. Really dope. And, cool. and I think that's pretty similar to the same kind of thing that like you have set up, but where GitHub is naturally already set up to automatically post. Are you on Netlify or Cell or something like that? Am I on Netlify? Side? Yeah, You're it's Netlify. Netlify. Yeah, so it's it's kind of similar, right? Where anytime you push a change up to GitHub um, to that markdown file, it's going to automatically deploy your Gatsby site again. So it's the same kind of concept, except WordPress is now sending that trigger request over to Netlify directly, and it's pulling in all well, that new content. There is a big difference in that when you work purely with a static file and you work with a bunch of markdown files so that you store everything in the file system. So when you push it to mm -hmm. Netlify, it traverses the file system and for every markdown page, it creates a URL. But in your case, it's just data. Like how does it know how many pages does it need to make uh, available? Sure. So I, I would think though that, so Gatsby handles a lot of that on the back end though, right? Where right. Gatsby is the one who's actually taking all your markdown files and compiling them into the project. So it's a similar thing here, except you got to kind of do a little bit more manually with Next.js, but I can show mm -hmm. what that looks like. Um, so I think that's going to be inside this. So you might notice the the naming structure for these directories. So if you're not familiar with Next.js, what this is going to do is it's called a file system API, where I can define these brackets around my directory names. And that's going to basically create it as a parameter or a variable that I'm going to be able to pull in when Next.js goes through and builds the site. So in particular, mm -hmm. this first directory is my slug parent which is going to be like a top level page. And I'm defining that statically as one parameter where this double bracket with this, with the, what is it called? The three dots and slug mm -hmm. child. That's basically saying that it's a dynamic parameter and it can be a bunch of different ones. But when that ultimately gets pulled down, 
if we scroll down to the bottom of this page, you run this function called get static paths inside of Next.js, where the very first thing I do is I'm going to create a GraphQL query that I'm going to get all of the pages inside of WordPress. I'm going to then create a series of paths, which those paths are ultimately what I tell Next.js what I want to be available for my site. So as it goes through, I create a new slug and parent parameter for every single different path on my project. And that's going to be what ultimately is provided to me what Next.js goes through and builds each and every one of those pages. Mm. Does that we make got sense? a question. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Got it now. We got a question from Igor. What is the difference between Web Dev Studios Next.js WordPress Starter and your WordPress Starter? Sure. So I, I I don't know too much. Um, like I've seen it and I I haven't really played around with it too much. Um, I I'm not sure if it was this one or another one, but I remember looking at one and they use server side rendering along with for cell, and that's a completely valid approach. Like that's a really great use case. But I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to uh, build my own static version of it and use uh, WP GraphQL and. Um, it, it was just like a fun, challenging side project for me. So um, I. I'll be honest, I don't know a ton of the differences between the two. Hmm. All right. So we can continue with the with the site. Sure. So when you have get static paths, uh, once we ultimately pass all those paths to Next.js, when it runs each and every one of those pages to build, it'll run this get static props function, which we kind of saw back on our homepage. Mm -hmm. So so again, for every single page that we're creating, we're running get static props. So at that point, we're passing those same parameters that we just defined into that function where we then request the page content that we're going to build out. And we're going to also distinguish what that page URI is going to be. And then we're going to pass that to the page. And at that point, you're really rendering whatever you want, similar to um, a React component, right? So it, we're mm -hmm. just taking that data and passing it as a prop into our page. But I can show what that actual GraphQL query, Graph, GraphQL query looks like. Um, so if I search for this function, for instance, it's uh, get page URI uh, by URI. So once we make mm -hmm. that search for that string, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up the Apollo client, which is what we use under the hood to make the actual GraphQL queries. Um, but then the query itself we have inside of, let's see, data pages. Inside of here is where we're defining all those queries. And we're doing this mm -hmm. just as a way to kind of more easily be able to set these things up. And here, particularly, get query by page ID, we have this base query that wraps the entire content. But the only thing that's different is we pass in this ID, which allows us to tell, basically specify inside of that ID, uh, specify which page we're trying to look up inside of the GraphQL uh, data interface. And it grabs that data for us, and it passes it back into our function and ultimately back into our page, which is where we then pass it to our React component and render it out. Mm, nice. And for those who didn't work with uh, GraphQL before, this query might look very intimidating. But I believe that you didn't have to write it by hand. You basically used that interactive uh, tool. Yeah, exactly. So the very first time, like. Now, at this point in time, like I'll go through and I'll just tweak little fields that I want. So like anytime I add a new field that I want to grab for like my featured image or anything else, like I'll, I'll usually just add that field manually. But the very first time that I set all this up, I went into my GraphQL IDE. And just like I'm doing here, I went through and I visually created the actual content that I needed. Because part of it mm -hmm. is like when I was first working with this, I didn't really know what data was actually available to me, right? And as again, I'm not a GraphQL expert, so being able to kind of go through this and visually constructing what this query looks like is just a much easier experience for somebody who's not as experienced with it. And you actually can preview the data when you receive it. That's also cool. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the best parts about it because then you'll actually know if it works. Not only are you constructing those queries, is you're actually confirming that what you're querying is correct. So it's a great way to get that set up. Um, so, mm, by the way, another good question yeah, about uh, sure. images. How do you handle it? Like possible integration assets with Cloud for, for CDN. So that's a good question. I think so. I know that there's definitely uh, WordPress plugins that you can do that. And when you set it up 
via WordPress, it's going to include. So my understanding of like the WordPress plugins for that is it'll replace each image instance that gets sent out in the API with that CloudFront URL um, or whatever CDN that you're using. So when you would query it here, it would automatically do that. Now that said, there's definitely some other possibilities. So for instance, um, I know there's some examples of people parsing the HTML because ultimately when we query this page, and I can show that, um, the content that we query is just an HTML string. So, mm -hmm. oops. So in some instances, what I'm doing and what I'm doing on spacejelly.dev is we can take this HTML string and we can parse it and we can add whatever dynamic aspects or URL replacements that we want, where I think actually Jason Langsdorf, let me see, rehype, Cloudinary, Jason. I'm sure he actually did that. Yeah, so Jason Langsdorf actually created a package that will do this for you. So mm -hmm. Rehype, so this is going down a rabbit hole, um, but Rehype is a package that will allow you to actually parse your HTML, or I think markup, yeah, markup HTML in this part. In even this before point, you it's, serve it. Even before you serve it. So mm -hmm. when you pull it into each of those page templates inside of React, it'll go through and it'll parse that HTML for you, allowing you to do whatever you want and transform it. So in this instance, Jason Langsdorf created a plugin that it'll go through and you pass in your your HTML string and you can replace everything you want. So he shows in this example is once it goes through this parser, he replaced it with a Cloudinary URL and you can do exactly the same thing with anything else, whether it's CloudFront or whatever image CDN you want. Um, it's really powerful and I'm, I'm actually starting to have a lot of fun with it. Um, the one thing that I did for spacejelly.dev isn't mm -hmm. anything super crazy, but I simply added this table of contents to my post because when I when I write my tutorials, I like to have these table of contents. And again, it's a simple thing, but it makes it easy for people to jump around. But and it's also, automatic. It's automatic. Like this is completely uh, automated. So anytime it goes through, the first thing it does is it creates the IDs for each of the H2s on my page, but then it takes that list of h2s and ids and titles and it just creates this simple uh link list at the top of the page um and that's completely all automated that way i don't have to manage that and mess around with it inside of wordpress it just happens automatically for me um so you know just another great thing about automating code tasks right like that right yeah and also you've shown a great example of why is it a good combination of because a lot of things like wordpress is so popular that a lot of things are already solved for it you just download mm -hmm. the plugin. Here you go. You want CDNs? Easy. <laughs> there is a plugin. Exactly. For it. That's so cool. Exactly. Yeah. So like like I was saying, you can either do it natively inside of the WordPress uh, plugin ecosystem itself, or you can. Um, there's definitely some other solutions out there that are already baked in code base for you. Um, so yeah, moving forward, I think if we go back, what were we waiting on before? Was it just the code? I can't remember what. Oh. We were. I don't actually remember also. <laughs> um, or maybe we were waiting for that earlier. Anyways, uh, OK, so I think what we can do is um, this is the Colby stack. So what we can do is actually plug in our WordPress instance. And we're going to use the same Next.js WordPress starter WordPress instance just because I already have that content there. Um, we kind of walked through. And it, again, it's just a default WordPress instance with a lot of stuff. So I'm going to first create an env file, which this is going to be my environment variables. And particularly inside the readme, we can see that to set this up, we want to def Oops, what did I do? We can define this WordPress GraphQL endpoint as an environment variable. Oops, I named it wrong. It needs to be .local, so let me fix that real quick. So env.local. Um, so the .local is a Next.js thing. It might be more code bases too, but particularly Next.js recognizes uh, env.local automatically as it's processing the websites. So what I can do is I can take this uh, environment variable I'm going to paste mm -hmm. it in here. And now we can update this with our website. So in particular, ours is going to be this IP here. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're, and we're going to paste in. We're going to leave that GraphQL at the end. Let me make sure that I paste that right. Yep. Um, so we're going to hit our WordPress instance, but we're going to hit the GraphQL uh, endpoint of that work. WordPress instance. And now let's run yarn dev, which is going to spin up a new, uh, it's going to spin up the local server. Mm -hmm. By the way, Colby, up. do you plan to make a TypeScript version of this library? 
of yours? Uh, I don't have any plans on it, but I definitely uh, take contributions. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, come in here. I, I accept pretty much all contributions. I welcome it with open arms. Um, so if you if you'd like to do that, I encourage you to come out and you know create an issue and we can discuss it or anything but i'm just That's i haven't great. gone down the typescripts uh hole yet so i'm still uh i think i got a, a youtube comment before that said it's 2021 and you're still not using typescript uh, i thought that was funny but, but yeah, I'm, I'm typescript, still... you, you could do really cool cool thing with the typescript and graphql you could automatically generate types and you wouldn't have to rely on clicking through the the interface and you would instantly kind of know what kind of data can you receive from your TypeScript. I suppose it's so. I'm not sure because uh, yeah. GitHub and I think Instagram, they all provide you some endpoint to introspect the data and generate the types from, from, from it. I would I would guess that if it's a GraphQL thing that it might be um, implemented because uh, mm -hmm. Jason Ball is the one who is the main creator and maintainer of WP GraphQL. Um, he worked with uh, Gatsby for a little bit on this project as well, but he uh, he's been doing a lot of great things with it. I, I would imagine if it's something like that, it's probably in there, but I can't guarantee that. Um, but again, like if somebody wants to come on here, maybe it's a great learning experience for me for uh, getting into TypeScript, but just right now it doesn't have it in there yet. Um, yeah. So yeah, back to our local host. Uh, now this looks exactly the same as we saw before, but this is now our new uh, our new WordPress site. We mm -hmm. didn't do anything except spin up our Next.js starter. We plugged in our um, we plugged in that URL inside of an mm -hmm. environment variable. But now we have our WordPress site, um, and we can kind of get to see what this actually looks like, and we can see where that data is actually coming around. Um, so, for instance, in the code, like just as a really quick example, if I wanted to see what that uh, post content the post content looks like before I actually dump it on the page. Let's console log that out. And if I refresh the page, mm -hmm. actually, I think that would be my terminal. Yeah, so that's in my terminal because get static props actually runs on the node process. So that's why we would see that in the terminal. But we can see all that content directly in there and it's getting pulled straight from WordPress. But um, that's so what's this cool point, about. No, oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to say that the next just that's what's cool. You can generate the page uh, preemptively, like statically. You can generate it uh, as a regular uh, server response. And I think you can also make client side parts that fetch the data and then render it uh, in the browser. So yeah, you could absolutely. actually expect in some case that you would see uh, the messages in the browser console, not in the terminal. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, like once once it passes off that data, or it, it doesn't even need to pass off that data with or without it. Once it is inside of this React component, it's just React in the browser at that point. Um, so similarly, I can console log that out inside the component, and we can see all that post data just like we would expect mm -hmm. inside of a JavaScript or you know React application. It's um, it's in the browser, it's in the client, and we can do whatever we want with it. So um, at that point, that's where I'm actually looping through here, and we're creating each of these cards, which are just each of these data types mapped to the different parts of the UI. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to come in here and change something, I think I'm currently, or even if we just want to put it out into a string just to prove that mm -hmm. that's happening. String of I, what is it, null? Two, is that how you make it pretty? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Let's see if that works. Um, it didn't make it pretty, but as we can see, I just changed all that content and I'm, you know, dumping it out on the page. Um, so really, we can do whatever we want with it at that point. And it's all coming from a default WordPress instance. That's all really nice. And I, lo I love how easy it is to set it up. Like everything works out of the box and then you can just expand it and add new parts and that's awesome. Exactly. Cool. Like I think that's one of my favorite parts because like this is a really simple blog website, right? Like maybe if your if your goal is just to simply get a site up there, like this is perfect. But from here, like it's very unopinionated intentionally, so that you can come in here and do whatever you want with it. And it's really just a skeleton starting point to you know make it easy to spin up a new uh, WordPress Next.js instance. And for example, if you want to add, uh, for example, set up a membership site. As WordPress mm -hmm. already has plugins for authentication, you probably can easily integrate it with Next.js as well. So that's an interesting point. And I think it might be a little bit challenging with the static only aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to go into the Next.js SSR, this server-side rendering, absolutely. Um, because at that point, I think you 
just need to pass in some of the WordPress credentials uh, because the API that we're hitting for Next.js is publicly accessible, uh, meaning you don't need any credentials to actually hit those endpoints. Um, but I know that there's also authenticated requests inside of uh, WordPress where you can do that inside of server-side rendering and make it completely dynamic based exactly what you're saying. Yeah, and for admin panel, uh, I don't think it, it makes sense to have it statically rendered anyway. So yeah, totally yeah, just exactly. server render. And yeah. there is another question. Uh, how do you handle styling for the various uh, Gutenberg uh, blocks? So that's a good question. Um, currently, so with WP GraphQL, my understanding is that WordPress doesn't actually make it easy at the moment to access those blocks. It's something that they're currently working on. So uh, there's not really stupid question. Uh, what is Gutenberg's block? I'm uneducated in this on this matter. Sure. Um, so let's go back into the WordPress. Uh, IDE. Um, and I also want to just preface this with I'm also not a WordPress uh, expert. Like I like part of my goal is for people who also aren't like WordPress experts. Like I, I know my way around, but I'm not an expert with how, how all this is. I'm actually using classic in here. Let me go to my space jelly because I think I'm using the regular there. Yeah, so inside of this is the Gutenberg editor um, mm -hmm. and it's just the name of their of WordPress's newer uh, content editor experience, where it's, I believe it's built on top of React, if I'm not mistaken, or it's at least JavaScript based as opposed to um, the previous experiences. We um, can actually where check maybe the um, develop React developer tools will pop up and then we'll see that it's oh, a that's React. That's a great monitor. idea. Um, I don't think, do I have React developer tools? No, I don't have React developer tools, but we can probably look inside the. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's React.js, yes. hmm. um, or at least parts of it is. But anyways, so the way that Gutenberg was actually uh, created, it my, under, my understanding of it is that it's not as connected to the standard WordPress database as the original editor was. So the way that it's stored, uh, I guess it's more difficult for them to query um, and bring it, uh, make it available for the WP GraphQL queries. So Currently, that's why we're kind of grabbing it as an HTML string, um, where we mm. pass that in. And then if we wanted to do anything dynamic with it, we use uh, the rehype uh, technology or uh, you know the, the library where we can actually parse the HTML and do stuff with it. Um, and I can also show that as an example, if that's interesting, of what I'm doing to create that table of contents. But um, I know, like for instance, I think probably the question goes along the lines of, um, like with the Gutenberg editor, you have a bunch of different widgets that you can create um, and add these in. And I don't, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know how some of those work quite yet in terms of uh, how it gets brought into the mm -hmm. um, GraphQL experience. I'm still kind of, it's still a work in progress. Like we want to keep building onto this current experience. It's pretty minimal at this point, but we wanna make it so you can really do anything you'd expect out of a WordPress site um, inside of this so Next.js stack app. So do I understand it correctly that the Gutenberg blocks, at least some kinds of widgets, can get broken uh, when you serve them through the Next.js frontend? So I wouldn't say, yeah, yeah, that's probably, I mean, we can actually just test that. So I'll just break my <laughs> website quick because <laughs> I'm curious <laughs> as to what actually happens. Um, I don't know what, uh, I haven't used any of these. Is there a particular one that people are interested in? Um, yeah, let's see if there will be comments. Yeah. Maybe some particular that is the most worrisome. Yeah, maybe the social icons. I don't know how to even make it work. Let's just see what happens when I update it mm -hmm. with that. Um, so I hit update, and I can even show inside of Netlify. I don't think I have anything secret in here. <laughs> oh, there is another good question about the custom fields. Like we pick GraphQL and we pick, like, what, what is it? If you have, yeah, so ACF, I'm using ACF actually with my spacejelly.dev site. Um, so I can even show that. So if we scroll down to the bottom of this page, sorry for the quick scroll, like I have custom uh, custom fields set up for each of my posts so that I can um, kind of do it what I want with it. And yeah, ACF works perfectly fine. Um, mm. But if we go back to Netlify, like we can see that um, it was deployed by a trigger of that WordPress hook as soon as I made that update. Um, but once that's done, does it, building. Does it understand that some pages were already built once? It's a good and question. Can it cache? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, 
I would think so because since it's coming from the GraphQL source, mm -hmm. but I, I haven't actually looked in that too much. I think that's one of the things uh, that myself and one of the other uh, contributors, um, Guillermo, he's been working a lot with me on that. And I know that's something that we both want to look into to make sure that it is actually getting cached and such. Um, but anyways, like it, it already deployed live since then. And let's go check it out on this one. Or what page was that? Sorry for scrolling around so quickly. So that's right after the intro. Does it just not mm -hmm. show it? Yeah, it's so just not showing it. It got stripped out, maybe. Completely. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. I wouldn't. Oh, look at that. So WP blocks social links. So it's not even mm -hmm. sure. Is that because I didn't set it up right? Because I see that it has these blocks. I don't know how to actually use them. Maybe there is some JavaScript part that needs to be served as well that will be executed on the front end if it would be yeah. regular WordPress. That's a good point. I'm not entirely mm. sure. Um, but as we can see, like it was in there and it's definitely not going to work by default. But that's, you know, that's a good thing that I can add as an issue that we can start looking into. Um, and again, if anybody's interested in contributing to this, definitely like hop in. We'd love to have more, uh, more help with kind of building out some of these features to make it um, as, as much of a experience out of the box as you'd expect for WordPress. Yeah, but this is great. And also like just uh, getting uh, like some understanding of the limitations and what are kind of the bleeding edge of this technology where all the progress is going to be happening is uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And like, honestly, like, m maybe not everybody want needs those special features. Like, I wonder how many people actually use any of those. And that's not an excuse not to try to look it up and try to figure it out. But um, like, I think being able to just at the simplest and like for my use case by the simplest is getting something that you can uh use the rich editor to add blog post content like that's exactly what i use it for and i'm sure there's others who do the same and being able to give this kind of experience to um because wordpress still is the king cms here and so many people are familiar with wordpress if you're still able to provide mm -hmm. your customers with a wordpress experience but you're able to do whatever you want with it on the front end there's something really powerful with that yeah, I think it's really great. A lot of editors know how to work with uh, WordPress, like content uh, managers and such. And also a lot of developers who develop uh, plugins for WordPress, PHP developers. Exactly. That's also exactly. quite cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, if you if you want, I'm not sure where you want to go next. I can show you what that Space Jelly, uh, the table of contents kind of looks like. Yeah, let's go. But that's actually interesting. Sure. Cool. Uh, let me pull that. Wait up a second. In. Here you go. First pull up. And there you use already pre-made the uh, plugin that does it for you, right? Uh, so, no, so kind of. So what I'm using is Rehype. Um, uh -huh. Let me pull that up first. So Rehype is really the tool uh, that creates. So I'm, I'm still kind of new to this, but what it is is the tool and library that wraps the content that allows me to make changes to the DOM. So essentially, mm -hmm. um, imagine, imagine like, I don't know, jQuery or React. Like it, it takes my HTML, it turns it into DOM nodes, and then it takes those nodes where I'm able to manip manipulate them as I want. So we can show you that here. Um, let me see, post, post, or here. That's um, okay. So the very first function that I run here is I have this add IDs to the headers in the HTML. And at this point, all I'm doing is I'm passing that content, which is a string of HTML inside of this function. And now let's mm -hmm. open that up. So inside here, this is where it actually happens with transformation. So um, again, I abstracted this other function called transform HTML. But what I'm doing in here is for every single node, it's going to run this function where it first checks the type of that node. It sees if it's a text node. And if that is the case, it's going to take the value of that node, which if you're back inside of the, the website, or spacejelly.dev, we went away from it. So in this instance, it's going to be each of the titles of the H2. So it grabs mm -hmm. that title. And it uses a package called parameterize, which it turns it into basically a URL slug. Um, so that's how we're able to add it as an ID. But then we simply apply that ID directly on that node and transform it, effectively rendering that ID for every single tag. Now, in terms of this transform HTML function, this is where I'm actually wrapping that rehype library. So mm -hmm. 
unified is the pipeline process. And this is where I start to get iffy on my actual understanding of how all this works. But unified is that pipeline where you set up a new instance and you're actually using that parse technology from Rehype. And it's going to break up all that HTML into the different text nodes that we can use and modify each of those nodes. So we come in here and I have this transform function. Oops, what did I click? We have this transform function that we run on each of the nodes. Um, and then it turns it back into a string. It processes all that based off of the parameters that we set. And mm -hmm. we return it back as a string that we can use directly inside of our uh, directly inside of our Next.js app. Um, and at that point, uh, get header anchors. This is where I'm just simply grabbing all those anchors based off of the content. Um, but then we render it into the page just like we would any other data inside of our app. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, make sense? What, yes, one question about how the HTML string is being parsed. Like, how do you break it into nodes? Ooh, I didn't quite catch what did it. Sure. So I don't know the specifics it's using the rehype parse so we can mm. go back to there and i don't know if okay. i don't really have a ton of documentation but it's using this library to actually uh take take mm -hmm. the different parts of the html and break it up into the nodes that we can make available um you might have also heard from the markdown world remark i know that's mm -hmm. uh popular inside of gatsby my understanding is rehype and remark are very similar it's just that remark is for markdown and rehype specifically is for HTML. yeah mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. my understanding, at least. OK, got it now. Cool. That's uh, That clear, cleared a lot of uh, things out. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you. Uh, hopefully it's not to, more confusing. <laughs> to, tell you, to, to tell a little bit about the uh, light sale that you're using to spin up the WordPress instance. Sure. Yeah, Let's. Uh, I can try to log in. Hopefully, I might have to pull this off screen for a second if I need to log in. But let's see. Um, Cool. OK, so it was already good. Um, so let us go to light sale. Does it abstract only container creation or the whole WordPress uh, is already available as a, I don't know, like a preset? So, uh, so it's available as a preset. And I can show hmm. a little bit about that. But um, so <laughs> I don't know the specifics. So again, uh, like I'm trying to speak based off of what I understand. But um, so when I'm going in here, it's creating a new EC. My understanding is it's creating a new EC2 instance um, where like you can even have snapshots of it and everything. But it's it creates it a predefined snapshot based off of uh, bit. It's Bitnami, which is, I believe is mm -hmm. the company that maintains these WordPress instances. Um, but basically, it's an out of the box EC2 instance with WordPress um, where you then have the ability to um, you know, do ever do pretty much anything you'd want with a typical um, AWS EC2 instance. Um, but for for just simply spinning up a WordPress instance, it's something that I don't really need to think about or care about or worry about. All I know is I'm spinning up a WordPress instance. Um, I'm setting the public, you know, you know the public uh, IP for it. Um, I can have snapshots that way. If you know a WordPress update blows up my site, I can come back here and revert to a snapshot. So that's great. And you know, similar to anything else inside of AWS, you have access to that um, huge library. But it's a very simple process to actually get going. And while I'm not going to create a full instance, we can kind of just get an idea of what this looks like. So when you go into here and create a new instance, um, you know. Like you would expect, you can select different applications. Um, mm -hmm. WordPress isn't the only thing. Like you can see, we have Drupal. We even have a Node.js server. We have Ghost. Do you know if Drupal or Joomla have the same kind of GraphQL endpoints nowadays? Did you? I'm actually not sure. This? I'd be surprised. I've I've never used Joomla or Drupal before. Like mm -hmm. I'm familiar with them, but I've never actually used them. Um, so I'd be surprised if at least Drupal doesn't, just because of how popular it is uh, and mm -hmm. people are still using it. But I I can't answer that. Um, but yeah, like, you know, you come in here and you create, a, you select WordPress. And at this point, it's very cookie cutter. Like you just start putting in your different, uh, your options, like your name and stuff. Yeah, how much do you um, want to spend? Mm. Exactly. And like the cool thing is, if my understanding is correctly or correct, it's one of the cheaper options for a base WordPress instance. And the uh -huh. nice thing is for the static site, we're only using it at compile time. So it's really only 
doing a small amount of processing Ooh. compared to a typical WordPress site. So that's why I'm completely safe in this $3.50 per month uh, WordPress fee where some other sites charge like $5 for that kind of thing. And it can go, you know, there's definitely higher prices here, but I'm never mm -hmm. going to use all these resources that are going to make me have to spend more than that $3.50 because I'm only doing it at compile time. Yeah, that's um, really cool. And this answers like the question, why? Why would you need the Next.js frontend? That's that's yeah. the answer. Like twice as little uh, that you would pay otherwise, and also you really don't uh, waste as much resources. Yeah, and like request. I, the reason I like to go static first is because I don't have to think about those things. Like I don't have to think about having servers. And you know, Vercel does a really great job. And I know Next uh, Netlify has Essential Next.js plugin, which um, turns some of the server side functionality into serverless functions, and that's great too. But I, I just like the idea and the peace of mind where if I if I have a static site, I don't really have to think about that kind of stuff. That's awesome. I really like how everything is so simple, like light sale. And here you go. You have a WordPress instance. <laughs> then you just uh, uh, launch the, the, the Yarn script that creates the application for you, the Next.js. It's already set up. You just need to set the .env uh, file with the variable. That's it. <laughs> here you go. Exactly. <laughs> it's done. Exactly. So and cool. like, I'm not, I'm not here trying to sell light sale or anything. I just, it's worked really well for me and, um, the price is competitive. So that's another thing that's really attractive, uh, for me. Um, but you know, this, this same setup should work for really any WordPress site, whether that's self-hosted or wherever it's hosted. Um, as long as you have that plugin installed for WP GraphQL, you just plug in that endpoint. And like you said, you have an XJS site. That's really cool. Yeah, you definitely inspired me to check out this stack, and I, I, I think I'm gonna try to migrate my website to this thing because I want to start blogging again. <laughs> and yeah, you also said in the beginning that I should do blogging on my personal website first, and then only cross post to others. So that's yeah. also a good point. Really nice. By yeah. the way, do you run a newsletter? I do. So I send out a weekly newsletter. Uh, if you want to check it out, it's colbyfayak.com slash newsletter. I don't think I actually have any of the old issues up. I definitely don't, rather. Um, but really what I just send is um, a weekly update with some of the content that I created from the past week, because I try to do like a tutorial a week. Um, and then on top of that, I really just send a few fun things, uh, like what I'm watching that week on TV and like something I learned and uh, maybe a pick if I find something interesting on the web. Um, but yeah, mostly like it's centered around being able to send out my free content each week so people can kind of get it right to their mm, inbox. Nice. So you can get notified. If you send me the link in the private, I'll, I will also sure. uh, add it cool. to the description. And uh, if you don't mind, can you share what kind of uh, service do you use to send emails? I'm just, I just want to know for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I really like your setup. <laughs> so I use ConvertKit, um, uh -huh. which you know it has its flaws, but the nice thing about it is like it has a lot of fun uh, powerful functionality around kind of like segmenting uh, the people coming in. So um, like if I'm bringing people in on a particular form, like if I'm bringing people in on this newsletter form compared to another one, it just has a easy way for me to tag those people so I can send them only this content. Um, or if somebody's coming in from one of my other newsletters, uh, cause like I use the same exact, uh, convert kit account for like my other newsletter that I created. Um, mm. That way I can send them separately to people and not have to really think about it. Um, that said, the convert kit UI isn't the greatest experience for uh, developing emails, but um, as long as you can kind of look past that, there's like, there's, it's really powerful for managing web uh, email newsletters. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. I was thinking maybe use some sort of API integration and also some automated <laughs> emailing thing that every time you have a new post it notifies everyone no no not yet um i do have an rss link i know rss is like kind of dead at this point let's see i think i have it still on the page like not many people use rss i think the page is just taking a while to load sure. anyways i do have an rss feed somewhere on that so that if somebody wants to plug it into their rss feed at least they can do that yeah feed.xml is it still a thing? I, I haven't seen people who would use RSS lately. <laughs> That's a good question. Like, I still use it. So um, uh -huh. I don't know. Like, I don't have a ton of different blog posts on it, but I have a few on there that I'll every so often go in and check. Um, mm. Oh, I guess that's another interesting thing that I can show. So part of what I've built inside of, I completely skipped over that part. So part of what I built inside of the Next.js uh, starter is I created the ability for 
to take this WordPress content and it actually builds out um, a sitemap and it also builds out an RSS feed automatically. Uh, this mm -hmm. is in addition to that search index that I was talking about earlier. So what it does is it comes in here, it queries all the posts, kind of similar to what we were showing before, um, but it goes through and during the Webpack build process, um, it takes all that data and transforms it into an XML feed or your sitemap, and it automatically spits out those files so that you have them easy to plug in for you know SEO purposes or just giving people the ability to use that feed. Interesting. I would actually expect that it would be included in the default uh, Next.js. Uh... Yeah, so they don't... Uh... They don't have it. I know there's a plugin, and I'm pretty sure they do something similar. Um, I don't know too much about the specifics about that, but I wanted a way to be able to control the content uh, for that actually goes into it. Because otherwise, like some instances, you'll have um, where they'll just dump every single page inside of the uh, uh, inside of the sitemap or inside of the feed. But yep, long live RSS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I tried to use the uh, what is it called the newsboat. Uh, last year and then I had a bunch of subscriptions there was checking th sites through it and then somehow I stopped I don't know why interesting I haven't heard of that one I use Feedly uh, feed L-Y F-E-E-D-L-Y um, it's the yeah, web based it just has probably right yeah it's web based yeah mm. I like to play with uh, terminal based uh, tools I don't know somehow it's just I okay. don't know fun <laughs> It's funny because, like, as a developer, like you'd think that I'd like to have all these uh, code base and uh, terminal based things, but I really appreciate good UIs, and that's why I like WordPress and being able to manage my. Content yeah, but I wouldn't. I, I'm not surprised. A lot of people prefer uh, GUI uh, over the text interfaces, yeah. like graphic interface. For yeah. Kubernetes, for example, pe some people use uh, console. Some people use. I forgot the name of the tool. Mm, that uh, allow you to to navigate through the containers the and the pods mm. like i haven't actually worked, worked with kubernetes yet so i'm, I'm not familiar i uh, didn't work with it really like in production i've just played with it a little bit mm. and um i saw how people do it <laughs> at work <laughs> yeah. but yeah i don't i also don't have uh, much enough experience to uh, really say anything about it for now yeah but have you tried, by the way, the Docker instances, uh, the developer, how do you call it? Devel VS Code developer containers. No. Because this is, is a that, great opportunity. Is that the online? Uh, no, 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 no. Like... I, I mean, when you have a container, uh, container settings, and VS Code automatically detects, okay, this project has a container that can be run as a developer container. And VS Code itself launches inside of this container. So you can edit the files in the running on the running instance huh. of this no, container that. Th th that's actually a very handy thing uh you completely solve the problem of onboarding new people on the project for example when someone yeah. joins you don't have to explain like look you need this this and that uh, installed and then you need to pull one dependencies from one source and whatever you just um, give the instructions on how to well, basically, press the button, <laughs> and uh, VS Code autom automatically uh, spins up the uh, the container. You can specify what ports should it make available. So, for example, in our case, it could spin up. Actually, it could spin up simultaneously the dev server that would rebuild Next.js if we change something in React files, and the yeah. WordPress uh, server, and connect them. And yeah, uh, yeah that's a really cool thing. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely know and have struggled with the pains of dealing with that kind of stuff. Because like there was one job where I know I had to like SSH into a dev environment anytime I wanted to work. Or there was another one where I actually had to, because of like the security uh, clearances and stuff, I actually had to log into a virtual Windows machine in order to work with the code. So it's it's been an interesting past. And I could see where that would definitely be a lot more, uh, a lot better of an experience. Yeah, one of the things that initially kind of intimidated or scared me when I started working with uh, Docker is that uh, it is actually a very good tool and it's a very good thing that they have this design. Is it a part of uh, Docker design, actually? I mean, when you have an infrastructure as a code, so instead of dealing with uh, internals of running container, you every time you need to change it, you just kill it and uh, spin up, spin up again. That's yeah. that's cool, but when you really need to figure out what's going on, like you're not getting logs for some reason and something is acting fun funny, uh, you want to uh, connect SSH through the container and then deal with it. And it's not very comfortable to do, I, I would say. I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, like I, I'm, I've tried to work with Docker and I just have not done a great job at working with Docker before. I know it can be really powerful and the people that are familiar with using it do some great things with it. Cause like the teams that I've worked with have used Docker. I just, I have such a hard time trying to work with it. I just don't understand it. Like I, I understand the gist and like what it is, but I just can't get the syntax to work or something. I always struggle with it. Hmm. We got another comment about um, uh, page rebuilds for the static site. There is a revalid day to one on the get static props. I wonder what it does because I'm not very proficient with Next.js. Yeah, so that's that's definitely a great feature. Um, my, I believe that it's uh, a Vercel only feature right now. I'm not sure if Next on Netlify actually supports that, but um, what it's actually doing is when you use the revalidate option, um, you're still serving, you're going to be serving the site through a server. So mm -hmm. essentially, when you make a request to a page, you're going to hit a server, um, but that server is going to return a static file. So while you're still certain hitting a server, you're going to essentially mm -hmm. get the benefits of a static page uh, aside from hitting the server. Um, but what's going to happen is in the background, and I actually, <laughs> I can, no, I, I, I was going to say I have slides on this, but I'm not going to bother doing that. Um, okay. <laughs> but what happens in the background is it'll refresh that page so that the next person that comes and visits the site, they'll still get a static page, but they'll get the refreshed version of that page. So mm. it's very, it's actually very similar and we're coming full circle to like, the past serverful implementations where mm -hmm. like you just have a very heavily cached CD CDN on the edge yeah, exactly. of your mm -hmm. server request. It's so, like it's it's the same kind of thing. It's just like I really enjoy working with Next.js. So it's all kind of bundled in there. So that's why it's still a nice thing. But um some people are like, why are you going to Next.js? Like it's you're basically just reinventing the same thing that we had before. And there's some truth to that, but we can work right inside of uh React JS with everything. Yeah, that's that's really cool. And yeah, the history again is uh, is a spiral. <laughs> we went full, yeah, full yeah. circle. That's and the thing cool. that I also really like about tools like Next.js is they're they're really bleeding edge with the different features that they're supporting. And mm -hmm. while I don't know like when they're going to they release it, but if you I don't know if you've seen uh, Next or sorry React.js was talking about how they're going to do server components, which yeah, is yeah, a yeah. new API to be able to ship less code to the browser, which is brilliant. But the the best part about that is like. It's a cool feature, but I don't even have to think about that feature because Next.js will implement that. And they've already said that they'll implement that so that they'll automatically handle that stuff. And I would imagine it would be kind of similar to some of the APIs that we've seen here, like get static props and get uh, server side props, where it'll detect if you're actually using server side data or something like that and serve it for you that way. But it's just another way that we can optimize our sites and not have to think about it because the framework maintainers are the yeah. ones doing the heavy lifting for those APIs. And it abstracts all those details. To be, to be honest, this new feature that they're working on, the server components, it scares me uh, a little bit because now we'll have two kinds of kind of the same thing. And they will... Yeah. Apparently, they will act differently. Like, uh, I don't remember. You cannot use hooks in the server components. You can only okay. get the data from the props, if I remember correctly. I might be completely wrong, and the API might change. But OK, we have two kinds of components with different behavior. Actually, we have three kinds. Classes. Yeah. Uh, we have one yeah. sort of distinction, class-based uh, com class components and function components. And now we have server client. And I'm like, I expect to be very much confused soon. No. I. <laughs> I'm right there with you. When I was seeing the demo, I thought the exact same thing. So, and like, I know they were saying it wasn't going to be the final version, most likely. So, we'll see what they actually come up with. But, like, my point being that ideally, like, as a user of Next.js, we, we mm -hmm. don't have to think about that. Next.js handles that all under the hood. Um, so, Let's that's hope. my hope. Exactly. So, like, all <laughs> we hope. have to think about is developing the components and they'll handle that, which, you know, it's that's a big win for the internet if they can do that because they're going to be able to optimize and pull, like, significantly lower how much JavaScript is being shipped to the browser. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, by the way, you've mentioned that uh, you like that Next.js is developing quickly and implementing all the new things that exist. Uh, I would like to ask, wasn't it ever a problem? Because, for example, Gatsby is also quite a high-paced project. Um, and uh, usually, like, I think I tried to upgrade to a major version three times already. And every time I had some <laughs> big problems <laughs> migrating. What about Next.js? 
Yeah, I haven't seen issues like that yet with Next.js, and I've been very fortunate upon that. I don't know mm. if they're specifically trying to, or to clarify with Next.js, I haven't had those issues. Uh, I've definitely had those issues with Gatsby, and it was frustrating. Um, I don't know if they're specifically going out of their way to prevent that kind of thing by, like, um, you know, if they have a new API. Like, I know they initially supported get initial props, where their new data fetching methods are the get static props and get server-side props, which is separate. Um, so I know that they're at least developing different APIs when they're introducing breaking functionality. So, you know, if if that's something they're keeping in the back of their head, that's it's doing a great job because you're right, I haven't run into backwards compatibility issues yet. You're lucky. But that's actually actually a good thing then. It means that at least for past, what, several years, they were very decent with their major releases. And they've... You know they've been they've come a long way since the initial release, like because they didn't even have static originally. Um, you know the the hybrid approach with both the uh, the, the revalidate that we kind of discussed, like that all is fairly new implementations to what Next.js was, and it's it's been awesome to see how much traction they've been able to gain on developing some of those. Yeah, features. that's impressive, for sure. By the way, we've got a question here, actually. It's specific, directed specifically to me, but if you have some good advice for this person, like what should a self-taught developer put in his CV when applying to the first job? So let's let's try make, uh, answering it in terms. In terms. So I would uh, specify whatever knowledge you genuinely have. First of all, like uh, lying or trying to look more impressive than you are is gonna only cause stress. So first thing I would recommend, be honest. Another thing, if you already have some job in mind, you can try to prepare and uh, learn at least something about the technologies that they want here. Ideally, you need, I would say I would apply with um, 70, maybe even like 60% of requirements covered because some of them might be optional. And people understand that it's quite easy to pick up the technical knowledge a couple of months and you're on track. Uh, and usually from what I've noticed, that might not apply to every job and every country and every person, but um, companies often look for a person who will it will be nice to work with. That's mm -hmm. important here. So first of all, this is why being honest and decent is, is, is crucial and it should be seen even in the CV that you're not trying to uh, trick them somehow or lure into hiring you. Just be honest, I know this, 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 I worked with this, this, and that. Um, I would also link some projects and some code because it makes uh, making the decision of uh, hiring you way easier. So for example, when I uh, got hired in, uh, in DICE, I had a blog post and a project that used exactly the same technologies as, the, as, as they did back then. Mm -hmm. It was Mobex, TypeScript, uh, no, it wasn't TypeScript. TypeScript, actually, that's the point about skipping some of the requirements. I didn't uh, know TypeScript at the moment, but I've learned it first months. And then I created a project with Mobex and React. And they were super happy. They didn't have to give me the some home assignment, you know, uh, assignment when you have to work for several hours in your free time trying to prepare for the, for the interview. Uh, so I just have shown them a blog. Uh, and the code, and that's it. And the interview was looking more like a friendly, a friendly chat. So, what do you think, Colby? What would be your advice? Yeah, and for a CV, a CV is kind of like a long form resume, right? Because I think typically in America, like we have our resume and our cover letter. And I've definitely heard CV, but I think it's like a long form. Um, so, yeah, I think I agree with a lot of the things you said. I think being honest about your actual work, um, but also kind of getting back to some of the things we talked about with uh, coding phase a few days mm -hmm. ago, like there's a lot of good things that can come from building projects open source, whether you're because if you're hosting these projects and playing around with things open in the public, they're going to have more things to be able to see and kind of prove um, how much you already know and what you, and it's also showing that you're actually excited about the work. Now, as somebody that's been on the hiring end, one of the things I really like to see is that people are actually excited about what they do. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be your life goal to be, uh, developing every second of every day. It just means that you're excited and you want to learn and that you want to get better at what you're doing. And that's that comes across, across as really important to me because even if somebody might be slightly better, if they're coming in it with a bad attitude and they don't really care about learning and that stuff, like I'm going to more, more likely go to the person that might have a little bit less ex of experience, but they're really excited to get in there, help mm -hmm. out, learn something and ultimately grow. Yeah, exactly. And another thing that is good about open source is that you not only can check out the code, 
that is the person is writing. But also you can see how the this person is communicating with other people. What yes. is the attitude, as you said, by the way? Like you can you can actually show show off like that you are <laughs> decent and you're great. Yeah. Exactly. Cause kind of to your point, like we like as humans, we ultimately want to work with other decent humans, right? So if somebody can go in there and kind of see that you're being a decent person on the internet and friendly to people, they're more likely to want to work with you as opposed to if they go to GitHub and see that all you're doing is complaining and you know not being such a great person. Um, so you know, also that being said, make sure you're being thoughtful about how you're treating others when you're uh, yeah. working in public on things like GitHub. Exactly. We recently had a stream uh, in our private uh, Discord of the React Bootcamp, and um, uh, I've invited my sister's husband, who actually have shown us how to uh, begin contributing to the open source, and that you don't necessarily have to start with the code. You can start with filing issues. If you found a bug, instead of just being silent, you can create a, and file an issue. Just make sure that it's uh, uh, easy to read, like it has a specific example. It has instructions of on how to reproduce it. If possible, to attach a GIF or a video, go ahead. It's very helpful. Um, and then be polite. Yeah, it's very important because open source developers, they don't owe uh, consumers anything, the cust not customers. Is it a customer of <laughs> open source? <laughs> exactly, it's not. Yeah, yeah so uh, and they also do it in their free time usually. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And I was just going to say, also, like there are other people on the other side of that. It's not like you're talking to some business. It's, it's another developer yeah. who's, who's spending their own time uh, to help you out with this. So just kind of be cognizant of that. Yeah, uh, uh, and be conscious about it because it's like it's natural to sort of dehumanize the, the person that you never even saw. You, like you, you see some nickname, you see some picture, and it doesn't feel like a real person is there that will be hurt. If you say something uh, wrong, so yeah, uh, open source is good. Be decent, <laughs> participate, and you can start with filing issues, not necessarily the code, and then or you can even uh, documentation. Exactly, fixing typos. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anything that could help. Actually, even communicating, because I consider uh, my conversation inside. What was it? I think it was TypeScript repo where we were discussing um, typing the higher order components because it's a complex topic. And mm -hmm. uh, I had a concern if it was actually a bug that was filed there because as I understood the documentation and how did the generics work in that case, my perception was that no, it might be by design. So I've posted mm -hmm. a bunch of examples showing that this can be solved without uh, typecasting. So here you go. And I consider it also as a as an open source contribution because it might have clarified something or absolutely. Like if you're helping somebody out or like if you're just helping somebody see it in a different perspective, like you're ultimately helping those maintainers from having to do extra work on their end, and they're going to be really appreciative by that. Yeah, exactly. That was very, very educational, like insp insp inspiring. You show not, you should have showed us, Jesus, what is happening with my English today? You have shown us how to set it up. You have uh, shown that it's easy. A few clicks on um, uh, AWS, a few clicks, a few type pins or clicks as well in your terminal. <laughs> and here you go. Everything is uh, spinned up, uh, spun up and running. Thank you so much. No. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, is there like any projects that you're working right now that you would like to mention? Yeah, sure. So I released on Friday a completely free three and a half hour crash course. So it's called From Design to Development. So if you want to head over to my YouTube channel and check that out, um, it takes you through uh, tools like Figma and Next.js and Storybook and um, a lot of great things. And like I'm saying, from design to development, it'll show you how to both design uh, the components and also how to develop them into a project. That's really cool. Actually, I like the design part, but I've shown my website in the beginning specifically to illustrate <laughs> yeah. that I indeed do like this. But, but I thank also, you, I, find, yeah, but, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I find it really important as developers uh, to have like a very fundamental knowledge of design. And I'm not saying, I always say this, I'm not saying to go out and get a design degree, but just being able to be slightly productive inside of Figma or something, it's really going to help your development process and how you're actually thinking about how components work. And it's just all, overall going to make you a better, well-rounded developer. Mm, being able to plan your design in the in Figma, for example. Exactly. Oh, there is another one last thing. Is there a way to make to make WordPress backend as headless? 
if seen seeing some tweaks. Uh, I didn't understand this. Wasn't what you've shown us a headless backend? Or so I'm wondering if the question is referring to like, is there some kind of headless mode? Because uh, when you like the website that I showed with WordPress, it wasn't mm -hmm. so like it, we used it as a headless WordPress. Yeah, exactly. But but it was still available as a front end if we wanted it to. Um, and mm -hmm. there's no specific like headless mode. Uh, what there is, is there's some kind of like headless themes that you can install where it just simply doesn't show anything in the front end of the application. Um, and really what you're doing is you're just taking it from being available off the web. Um, but yeah, there's some themes. I think one of the ones that I use, uh, I can even check and see. Um, Should they share your screen? Yes, just in case I find it. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. Does my space jelly one use it? So this one just uses a, a minimal page, but mm -hmm. let's see if this one uses it. Nope, this one doesn't use it either. But I know we can probably just look really quick. What is it under appearance? Themes. I forget how to do this. Add a theme. Um, I know there's like either headless. This one looks like it actually, that's actually not a headless API. I can't find it right off the top of my head, but I know that there is a theme that exists that mm -hmm. takes away all the content. Or you can develop your own theme that does it. Literally, you would just like prevent all the pages from rendering. Like you can drop in an index.php file, which for in PHP's sense is really the root of where all of your content is going to derive from for building the pages if you don't have other files. Um, and literally just render nothing and you essentially have like a headless version of it. It's kind of funny that I would never guess that this thing that would hide the pages would be a theme and not a plugin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and th that's a good question. Like maybe there is a plugin for it. I, I, ha I just haven't seen. But um, I know part of the plan. Uh, one of the other contributors, Kevin Cunningham, uh, that has been working with me on Next.js started. He was going to create uh, like a headless theme and like not mm -hmm. anything crazy associated with it. Really, just to prevent the content from showing. And I think he also wanted to make it so that we can bundle up the WP GraphQL plugin and you know those kind of things just to make it easier for people to spin up a new a new instance. Cool. So a lot of people are working in this WordPress plus static site generators niche. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like for my project alone, I've had, let's see, eight contributors. And I've been really fortunate that people have been wanting to come in here and contribute and always welcome, you know, again, always welcome anybody else who wants to come in here and uh, give a hand. Thank you so cool. much. Uh, I think yeah. you can actually send me the link to your course and I will also attach it to the description. Oh, okay. Why not? Uh, from <laughs> Yep, from from design to dot dev, and I'm pasting it in now. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I I set up a landing page just to make it easier for people to find. But cool, it's, and as it's you a, said, it's, it's free. free YouTube. Yep, yeah. free YouTube so, course. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Colby. That was great learning Thank experience. You. Thank you, uh, folks who participated in the chat. See you next time. See you, everybody. Bye bye.